Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we continue our series that takes a look at lesser known starships from various Star Wars factions. In our last episode, we took a look at Separatist capital ships. Now we'll be moving on to some of the more rare starfighters utilized by the Separatist Alliance Navy. But before we continue, please do subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. And if you do want to check out the entire series so far, we'll have a playlist in the description with all of those videos in. Now you guys know all about the Separatist Alliance's main starfighter, the Vulture Droid. It is featured in many of the films and TV shows, and it plays a big role in the CIS Navy. But have you guys ever heard of the Scarab Starfighter, its predecessor? The Scarab Starfighter had far less moving pieces. It couldn't walk around in patrol mode like the Vulture Droid could. This also meant that the Scarab class lacked the same type of maneuverability you would get from a Vulture class droid or one of the uh, droid tri-fighters. The Scarab did, however, make up for it by having a decent amount of armor and heavy deflector shields, which increased its survivability. More importantly, the Scarab-class droid fighter could actually operate independent from some type of control system, which meant that the Scarab-class droid fighter could keep fighting even if a Separatist control ship was destroyed. The Scarab starfighter would be tested by the Trade Federation during the invasion of Naboo in 32 BBY. A battle that ultimately ended up with the Trade Federation defeated because of its reliance on a centralized control ship. If only they had less vulture droids at the time and more Scarab starfighters. They probably could have changed the course of history, which actually might be a good video idea. Despite the fact that most Trade Federation executives preferred the vulture class starfighter, the Scarab class starfighter was still in use by the Confederacy during the Clone Wars. Because the Separatist Alliance was a relatively new confederation, its central military system still relied on planetary and local defense systems of its member states. While you had standardized ships and droids used by the CIS Navy, when Confederate forces were defending a system, they usually also relied on local militias for aid. The Nantex class territorial defense starfighter was developed by Hoopla Passatisk Shipwrights Collective and used by the Geon Oceans to protect their homeworld. The Geon Oceans were quite a strange and unique race, and their starfighter design was no different. The Nantex class was a relatively small ship at 9 meters in length. It lacked a hyperdrive, but it had a shield system. The ship had a small profile and was quite nimble. It was capable in both space and in atmosphere. The ship's large bubble cockpit gave the pilot almost a 360 degree field of view of their surroundings, which is terrific in a dogfight. The ship also utilized 100 small tractor beams to latch onto enemy fighters and essentially point their weapons at the right direction. A very interesting and unorthodox way to aim your starship. And judging by how much the Galactic Republic struggled with these fighters, the Nantex's more unorthodox design choices seem to be working very well. When we look at ships like the Z-95 Headhunter or the ARC-170 Starfighter, we oftentimes think about Incom Corporation, one of the most beloved and important starfighter manufacturers in galactic history. But without the help of another company known as Sublight Products Corporation, most of Incom's early designs would have never happened. Prior to the production of the Z-95, one of the best-selling ships in galactic history, Incom was just the repulsor lift manufacturer. They did projects that were important and massive, like Bespin's Cloud City, but they just weren't starfighter manufacturers. And so it was really Sublight Products or Subpro who brought all of the know-how about how to design and engineer a starfighter. And even though Subpro did their fair share of engineering and design on their collaborative works with Incom, they never truly received the same recognition and financial reward. Some might say it's because Subpro is located in the outer rim, and more importantly, it's ran by Trandoshans, which definitely cheapens its name and brand. The Nova Sword Space Superiority Starfighter was supposed to change all of this. This ship was supposed to build on the success of the Z-95 Headhunter and improve it in every single way. And Sublight Products Corporations would be the sole designer and manufacturer of this model. What she ended up having was a well-balanced ship with good shielding, good maneuverability, and also a hyperdrive. It could do anything from being a scout to an interceptor or even a salt vessel thanks to the concussion missile launchers on board. Unfortunately, it was still made by Trandoshan, so I guess no one bought it. The starship industry in Star Wars shares a lot of similarities with the automobile industry here on Earth. When you have a new brand, you start your first few products and try to make them as high-performing and luxurious as possible in order to establish a very high-value brand. 
like what Tesla did with the Tesla S. And then once you wowed your potential consumers, you start rolling out the cheaper and more standard models for the masses, AKA the Tesla Model 3. Republic Senior Systems, which would one day become Senior Fleet Systems, one of the most prolific shipbuilders in the entire galaxy, followed a similar business strategy. Before Senior Fleet Systems landed that massive Imperial contract to basically supply every starfighter in the Imperial Navy, Senior Fleet Systems was a relatively small and boutique starship designer. They focused on very innovative and forward thinking designs. One of their ships was the Star Courier, which was a small transport ship that exemplified what Republic Senior Fleet Systems stood for at the time. This was a limited production ship that was usually bought by very wealthy and influential businessmen or politicians from all across the galaxy who needed safe transport through very dangerous areas. These ships could be heavily modified, as was the case with the Shimitar. This was a special transport made specifically for Sith Lord Darth Maul. It featured a Class 1.5 hyperdrive robust shields and had many countermeasures that made scanning and locking onto the ship's signature very difficult. The ship even had a Stegium crystal-powered cloaking device, which made it essentially invisible. The Shimitar, like most Star Courier variants, lacked heavy weapons and only had six solar ionization cannons. These ships relied much more on stealth and speed for survival. The Rogue Class Porax 38 Starfighter, or the P-38, was manufactured by Bactoid Armor Workshop. Now this kind of looks like the Scarab class droid fighter we just talked about, but this ship actually does have a independent cockpit for a pilot, and it also has a life support system for organics as well. It was however mainly used by General Grievous or Osage Ventress's IG-99 Magna Guard droids during the Clone Wars. These ships were relatively small, but packed a punch with their two heavy laser cannons, which cycled at a very slow firing rate, but could cut right through the shields of most starfighters with just one shot. Bounty Hunter Cad Bane would own a specially modified Rogue class starfighter, which even had a cloaking device built into it. The Ginevex class starfighter was another Geonosian design specifically made for the Sith assassin Asajj Ventress. Only six of these ships were built for Asajj Ventress specifically, and so if you ever run into one on a scrap world, I highly recommend you secure it for yourself. The Guinea Vex or Fan Blade Starfighter is easy to spot because of its large solar sail, which not only gave the ship more sublight speed, it also served as a shield. The Fan Blade, however, did give off a lot of energy and had a huge signature on most sensors. It was not a very stealthy ship. Still, thanks to its strange design, the Fan Blade was amongst the fastest and most maneuverable ships on the battlefield, and its dual laser cannons were more than enough to destroy even the most capable starfighters. The environs came from a very dark world hidden inside of a nebula. They would evolve their own technology, language, and culture separate from the rest of the galaxy. It is not surprising that many of their main vehicles and weapons also functioned in very strange ways that was different from the rest of the galaxy. When the Embarans joined the Clone Wars on the side of the Confederacy, they also brought with them the full power of the Embaran militia, including the Embaran Starfighter. The most noticeable feature on the ship right away is the fact that its cockpit was not a physical structure. Instead, it was just a ray shield that had to be powered on. On top of that, the pilot used holographic interfaces to control the ship rather than joysticks and other mechanical inputs. These starfighters were equipped with missile pods and plasma cannons, and despite their strange design, were relatively easy to fly for the average individual, even without training. Amongst the Confederacy of Independent Systems' various member states was Valahari. This planet was known for having some of the best starfighter engineers and starfighter aces in the galaxy. This relatively small outer rim planet naturally became a part of the massive political game of tug-of-war being played by the Republic and Confederacy during the Clone Wars. Valahari wanted to stay neutral in the war, but sell its excellent starfighters to the Separatists. The Jedi attempted to intervene and even threatened to destroy any ships that were exported to the CIS Navy from Valahari. This resulted in a breakdown of relationships between the Valahari and the Jedi, and consequently, their best advanced starfighter design, the Tempest Zero, would be flown by native Valahari on behalf of the CIS Navy. The Tempest Zero starfighters were heavily armed with four forward-facing laser cannons and an additional backwards-facing laser cannon, along with a missile launcher. It also had a harpoon gun, which might seem impractical in space, but actually had its uses. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I buy that. But either way, these Tempest Zeros and their pilots gave the Republic a huge headache 
in the Outer Rim. So there you have it guys, eight of the lesser known starships utilized by the Confederacy of Independent Systems Navy. As you can see, most of these designs are planetary defense force or local defense force inspired. And so you have some really interesting and unorthodox starfighter design philosophy here. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.